Hello everyone, we hope you're doing very well. We're working our way through your viewer requested questions and today is from Brandon from Wisconsin question mark USA. Could you go over rudder input? When to use it? Why you should use it? The science behind it? And with all the different aircraft types in DCS World. We'll, we'll do our best to answer that without creating a you know massively long video. And again, as ever, we try to keep it simple for the layman because we're not a super technical group in that respect. Today, we've got with us RC, we've got OB, you know them, and we've got Tate, our very own GR aerodynamicist. Say hello, Tate. Hello there. So the first thing I want to describe very simply is what the rudder is and what effect it has on the aircraft. So the rudder is this chap here and it can wiggle left and we can wiggle right. Now, the first thing to say is that a lot of people think when they start looking at aircraft is that the rudder is like the rudder on a ship. The rudder on a ship, the main function is to change the course, you know, the direction of travel of the ship. That is not the same in an aircraft. We've got lots of videos when we're doing obstacle courses like that and people keep saying use the rudder, use the rudder to turn the aircraft. Well the rudder doesn't actually turn an aircraft so it's the first thing we need to clear up. So just looking at a very basic airplane flying here roughly straight in a straight line. If we push the rudder to the left or to the right we're going to have three main effects. The first effect is to increase the your slip angle. So if we're going to look at that we need to define some terms and these are our own terms we've made up just to make things as easy to understand as possible. First of all is the azimuth of movement. In fact, sorry, before we do that, we should go over the axis. We have a yaw axis, which is the blue one here. If you imagine turning the aircraft around the blue, that is turning around the yaw axis. This is the roll axis, this red one. If we turn it around this axis, we're turning it around roll. This is the pitch, and I'm sure you're getting a hang of it there. So we're just looking at a 2D plane. We're ignoring height for the time being. Azimuth of movement of the aircraft is going to be the velocity vector. It's basically the course of the aircraft. It's the actual direction that the aircraft is going. That is not the same thing as what the aircraft is pointing. The azimuth of the longitudinal axis of the aircraft is going to be the, the direction that the aircraft is pointing. So the aircraft is actually moving on a course of azimuth of movement and it's actually pointing on a course of azimuth of longitudinal axis. The yaw slip angle is the difference between those two, the difference between what the aircraft is actually pointing and what it's actually traveling on. So the main thing that is changed during usage of the rudder is the yaw slip. And you can have a really high yaw slip all the way up to tens of degrees. The second effect is that it can actually turn the aircraft's course, its azimuth of movement, but only very slightly. Especially in the big heavy fighters that we use, using the rudder barely actually turns the aircraft's direction of travel at all. And thirdly, we get a moment of roll. We get a roll torque. So because the rudder is, you know, up and above the longitudinal axis of the aircraft and not below, we have an unequal force and we have a roll torque, so it will force the plane to roll left or roll right. And those are the three main forces that are going to be implied by rudder. We now need to look at why we would use the rudder in flight. First of all is ground heading. The way the rudder acts on the aircraft changes a little bit when the aircraft is on the ground, when the wheels are on the ground and even if the aircraft's moving at quite a high speed. And one reason we would use the rudder, and you'll see all of us doing this in DCS apart from the Vigan which has automatic rudder which is really interesting, is if we're going down the runway, if there's wind taking us left or right or even if there's not wind you still need to use a little bit of rudder. You're only allowed to use nose wheel steering up to a certain speed, usually about 50 to 70 knots. At that point you have to turn your nose wheel steering off and you rely on your rudder once you have what we call rudder authority. At that point we're going to be changing our heading or maybe we could come back and say our azimuth of movement of our aircraft with the rudder to keep it in the center of the runway or at least keeping it parallel to the travel of the runway. Incidentally, once we leave the runway and the wheels are no longer touched in the ground, there is a slight difference of interaction between the rudder and the yaw of the aircraft. Would you like to elaborate on that slightly, Tate? So when you're on the ground and you uh, begin to take off, the engine on a propeller plane uh, especially will have a torque moment that takes you to the, either the left or right, depending on which way it's spinning. When you're on the ground, you've got the wheels to help you keep straight because the friction between the tyre and the ground is actually keeping you in one direction. So it might only need just a little bit of rudder. But you might notice when you take off, the wind will actually take you and, and provide some slip as you're going up. Now that is quite aerodynamically inefficient as you're showing more cross-sectional area. 
So what we have to do, we have to use the rudder slightly on the ground, and then when we get up, we have to use the rudder quite a lot more to avoid that slip. Roger, and if you've ever flown, for instance, a warbird, a warbird is where you get the most, uh, if you like, feel and feedback in DCS. If you go and fly a Hornet or a Mirage, it's all automated with something called fly-by-wire. You don't actually get hardly any feedback. You go and fly a Spitfire or something, and you'll see all these effects coming into play. The next thing we talk about, the usage of rudder, is increased roll rate. So, in DCS, some of the aircraft are very inefficient at rolling, changing their roll axis here. Examples, a Spitfire, the ailerons just simply aren't very effective at rolling the aircraft. A Tomcat doesn't even have ailerons. It's just, again, not particularly effective for reasons I don't understand at rolling. So one way to make those guys roll faster, and roll rate is important in combat, is to introduce complementary rudder. So if I'm going to roll to the right, I'll also rudder to the right in my Tomcat or my Spitfire, and it will increase my roll rate. The next is landing crabbing. If you watch our DCS videos where we do high winds, now the cool thing in DCS is it's not real and it doesn't matter if you crash. So you can just whack on a 100 knot crosswind if you want. Pretty suicidal, but you can do that. And the good thing about doing that is that you really learn the extreme nature of crabbing on a landing. For instance, if we had a big crosswind and we were coming into a runway, well, the runway is static and we have to drive our aircraft straight as we can onto the runway down the course of the runway now that with a crosswind a vector of force if you like pushing from one side that means the only way that we can do that is to turn our aircraft a certain amount into the wind let's just say 45 degrees so our your slip here which is the difference between the direction of travel and the direction we're pointing here all the way up to 45 degrees so we're traveling along the vector of the runway but the nose of our aircraft is pointing 45 degrees to the left to combat the force of the wind which is pushing from 90 degrees from the left and the main reason we would do that is we are changing our azimuth of thrust so that our azimuth of thrust the thing that's pushing us through the air is no longer pushing if you like that way it's now pushing that way that's my description of crabbing anything you want to add to that tape or just a better description you want to do so uh, there are complex interactions between uh, things like ground speed and uh, airspeed. So you can actually crab um, fully balanced mm. with no slip because you're facing into the direction that the wind is coming towards you. Because if, say, for example, if it's a 45 degree angle, you're going 100 knots forward and you've got 100 knot crosswind, that wind in relative to you is going to be coming at a 45 degree angle. But compared to the ground, yes, you are moving. You're pointing in one direction and moving 45 degrees in relation to that. The next thing, I'm going to skip number four here because number four is something I've just learned today. Um, as you know, I'm not a pilot and there's a lot of stuff I don't understand. So I'm going to skip this and I'll come back to it. Uh, number five is something that I do do, cross controlling. This can be done for various reasons. Here's where I use it in DCS. If we are approaching from behind a formation of warbirds, they're going 200 knots, I'm going 300 knots. I need to basically break. I've got to reduce my speed by 100 knots to fall into formation. Well, the warbirds don't have air brakes, unlike a Mirage or an F-14. So I need to find a way of slowing myself down. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to, on purpose, increase my your slip here. What that's going to do is present more cross-sectional area of the fuselage to the airflow. It's going to increase my drag and it's going to make me slow down. And the way I would do that is I would rudder to the right so that my aircraft was pointing to the right in this direction here, although it was still moving in this direction here. And then to ensure that my aircraft didn't start creeping to the right in terms of its travel, I would then counter the right rudder with left aileron. So at this point, I'm presenting a huge cross section of fuselage to the wind flow, and then that acts as my air brake. The main reason I've used cross controlling is on final approach to get yourself, if you're a little high, it's a good way of dropping off some altitude quickly without gaining speed. Mm -hmm. In real life, though, it is, it's not frowned upon, especially in small planes like that. It's, it's pretty common, but I don't think it's a, because uh, you're aerodynamically, I think you're unstable technically because mm -hmm. you, you're, you're going against what you should be doing. So it can end up in spins or mm -hmm. stalls if you're not careful. So you have to be very careful while you're doing it. One anecdotal ev a bit of evidence from me. Uh, I'm sure you all out there watch, uh, watch air crash investigation. And there was a aircraft that was coming down. It was out of fuel, a large aircraft, heavy. And it had one shot of making the runway. It didn't have any gas to go round. And he was coming in too fast. And so he had to slow down. And the only way he managed to slow down, obviously, if you land too fast, you go off the end of the runway, you die or 
you know, it's not going to end well either way. And so he had to put a massive slip, cross-controlled slip to act as an aero brake. And literally until the almost the second he touched the ground and then he straightened out, neutralized the aircraft. And that just managed to scrub 100 knots or whatever off his airspeed, which saved every, everyone on board. So it's just an anecdotal evidence of that. So is that that Gimli Glider, the one that ran it's out of the Glider, Yeah, Atlantic. exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 Okay, guys. Um, so one more thing here before we move on to the examples. Coordinated turn, something I've just learned about today. So imagine that we are going to turn this aircraft in a 180 degree turn. Well, what you know is that it rolls around this axis here, roughly 90 degrees, you know, just very rough. It's not quite true, but you know what I'm saying. And then he uses aft stick with the elevator and that will pull him round a corner with his wings, one wing facing up, one wing facing down. At that point, we have to think what's happening with his relative yaw. Well, what would actually happen if we imagine we take the aeroplane here as it is, just to pretend it's going around the corner, it would be doing something like that. What would tend to happen going around the corner and depending on the aircraft is that, for instance, the tail of the aircraft may start pulling downward. So in this is actually down towards the earth, the vector that I'm drawing here, bearing in mind that it's 90, at a 90 degree roll. At that point, that's called an uncoordinated turn. And that's because his relative your slip is in existence, it's more than zero, which means he's again presenting a inefficient cross section to the airflow. And it's important to coordinate your turn. So I'm going to pass it over to the guys to explain it maybe a bit better and how we use the turn slip indicator to ensure a coordinated turn. The turn slip indicator, the little ball in the middle there, is if you're in straight and level flight with no other forces on the aircraft, that will be centered in the middle, which is showing that you're balanced. But then say you are into a turn, into a bank, the ball will move off from the center and then you use the rudder the way, whichever way that say the ball's gone to the left then you use your rudder left rudder to bring the ball back into the center of those two bars and that means then you're in a coordinated turn yeah so coordinated perm is we do a bank turn and the yaw slip is zero or very nearly zero a useful way of looking at it is for example if the ball is a football you're trying to kick it between the goals so if it's off to the left of the two lines you have to press left rudder to kick it back between the goals. So in DCS, with a modern aircraft with, say, a fly-by-wire system like the F-16, it will fly around the corner, 90-degree bank or so, and the yaw slip will be controlled by the fly-by-wire system. Without you picking any rudder input, it will actually adjust the rudder left and right when you're going around to ensure that your yaw slip is as close to zero as is suitable. So you don't have to worry about it in a modern plane, is what I'm saying. Probably the same with a vegan and... Uh, uh, an F-15 and an F-18 and whatnot. But in DCS, if you jump in your Warbird, your BF-109, your Yak, whatever, that is not automated. And you will have to keep an eye here on your slip gauge. And in, to ensure a coordinated turn, you will have to do your own rudder work to ensure that our relative your slip is neutralized. So we've got some of Tate's examples here. First, we're gonna look at slow spiral mode. So um, as you saw from the beginning there, we're in for straight and level flight. Now all I've done here, I've not touched any other, um, I've not touched ailerons, I've not touched elevators, anything. All I've done is apply a slight amount of right rudder. And as you can see, we've ended up in what's called a slow spiral mode. So that's because as I've gone right, and our heading has very, very slightly changed, I've got more airspeed on the left wing than I have on the right wing, leading to an increase in lift on the left wing and a decrease in lift on the right wing. As you can see, this leads to us starting to spiral. I see, right. Yeah, no, I never didn't know that. That's how interesting. Okay, very good. Next, we've got a good spin example. So a spin is an example of a stall uh, where one wing stalls first. So if you've got rudder in a stall, you can see here, um, one wing stalls first and you end up in what's called a spin. So you can have several types of spins, it depends on what type of stall you've got. Uh, this is a relatively flat spin. At this point, I've actually let go of the rudder, oh no, I've got rudder on now, but at soon I'll let go of the rudder and you can see that we actually continue in this spin. Now this is a very, very dangerous manoeuvre, especially when you stall close to the ground. You cannot change, you cannot get out of a spin without doing uh, a very specific manoeuvre, which is you've got to rudder it in the opposite direction and then treat it as any other stall. So nose down and then pull up with the engine on. Roger. Let's so you can see I'm using all controls here. Yeah. Okay, so neutralised. Lovely. Very good. So this is an example of straight level flight while at uh, full right rudder. So this is an, an example of extreme slip. So you'll see me flattening the aircraft out here and then soon I'm just going to put full right rudder on. You can see I'm not at full power here. That's full right rudder. 
And to counteract that, so you can see the slip and turn indicator yet, yeah, as, as Caps uh, indicated, is at full left. Now we're actually going straight and level in terms of direction. Yep. However, I've had to apply more thrust because so much cross-sectional area is creating a lot of drag. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've actually applied more thrust um, to keep at the same speed and not stall. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that. You can see how uncomfortable it is to fly at those sorts of slip. Yeah, and it is. It is absolutely. I hate doing that. I, I get in such trouble when I do that. Next, we're going to go to Dutch roll mode. So you can see here is the Dutch roll mode. Um, this is just a, a bit of an example of what actually happens when you hit the rudder, and it's a an example of stability, uh, dynamic stability in the lateral uh, plane. So you can see here when we hit rudder, uh, looking face on, the nose is actually going to do a figure of eight as the wings start to roll. So hit the rudder yeah. there. And you can see that as it starts to roll, it's obviously damp, so it is a stable aircraft. But you can see the nose is actually doing that figure of eight motion. Roger. So you might find if you're whacking on quite a lot of um, rudder, you know, when you're crabbing for a landing, mm -hmm. you might end up with a bit of uh, a bit of oscillation. Yeah, absolutely, you do. And there's some actually, so there's some other non-rudder oscillations i'd love to talk about um but again that's for another that's for another day so we've looked at the examples in dcs where we would be using the rudder there may be other examples but those are just typical uses of what we use we've shown some just some interesting ideas here from tay is there anything anyone else wants to add about rudder i've got a, an example of supersonic if you want it yes send supersonic i've never heard about supersonic rudder but okay uh yeah so that's that's because we don't use it it's utterly useless it's it's not complicated but if you get a i'll, I'll try and get a that oh no i can't get a diagram up so when you're in supersonic flow uh imagine a flat plate if you change the back of that flat plate uh the flow only actually affects so the pressure differential which causes lift or, or yaw in the rudder's example mm -hmm. only affects that bit of the plate that's actually turned mm -hmm. because the pressure can't move upstream mm -hmm. because it's it's traveling faster than the speed of the pressure mm -hmm. when we're in supersonic that's why you have massive elevators on supersonic aircraft because otherwise they would only have a tiny amount of elevator to work with when they're at supersonic speeds whereas things like the f-18 the f-22 uh, have massive elevators so that full that the, the whole elevator actually mm -hmm. creates less only one more thing i would like to say uh, is that again uh, a boeing i think it was i think it was 737 air crash investigates crashed uh, several years ago and it turns out that the pilot was just getting sitting into his seat or the co-pilot was sitting in his seat and he thought he would just try the rudder pedals out you know get a feel for it give him a good bash and the pressure of that uh, ripped the whole vertical stab uh, stabilizer off the aircraft the, the whole tail fin ripped off and of course an aeroplane crashes and dies everyone died uh, this is in dcs as well uh, take a flanker and you go and jam uh, flight 400 knots jam the rudder left jam it right jam it left you know really harshly both of your vertical stabilizers will fall off and you'll die you'll immediately go into spin you've got no your correction of authority at that point it's just something to bear in mind if you're going to play around with your rudder um, especially in combat be careful it will rub, rip your um uh, your stabs off so that's as far as we're going with rudder you know we're not used to having an aerodynamicist so if you want to add more questions and stuff that you want to tease us with please do that we'll be happy to look things up i hope that helps and i'll see you later